It's very good to be back here with you again. Um, like, Dan like Dave said, it's been about 10 years since I've been here. And this was actually the first UU church I ever joined. And I think kind of like a first love, you know, it's always gonna hold a special place in my heart. Um, I was very much nourished here and my, um, my career as a religious educator was really started here and my, my career as a religious professional was really started here in the volunteer work and the, the mentoring that I got from both the staff and the, and the members here. So thank you for that. Um, when I, so when I was here before, I had spent all of my 25 years living in central Illinois. And after I left central Illinois, I spent a few years working in Minnesota um, before I went to New Hampshire to spend a year as an interim director of Lifespan Religious Education for a congregation there. And an interim director of Lifespan Religious Education is kind of like doing Amy's job, but with Dave's transitional perspective on it. So I'm there for just a limited period of time to support a transition. In this case, similar to the transition you're going through, they had had a religious educator who was there for about 30 years before, um, before I came in. After I left New Hampshire, I went to Chicago and was there for a couple of years serving a congregation in the same interim religious education kind of role. And then I moved to Chattanooga, Tennessee for the last couple of years. And this year I'm spending a year in Bloomington, which is great. I grew up outside of Bloomington, and so I'm getting a lot more family time, which has been really fun. I've got a niece and some nephews that I'm especially enjoying. While I was living outside of Chicago, my partner and I began looking for a place where we could really settle down. We were tired of moving around from place to place, going from job to job. And so we, were, we did a number of trips trying to figure out where, where's a good place to settle. He really wanted to live in a warmer climate, and I really didn't want to be too far from my family. We were also looking for a place that had lots of outdoor recreation activities. And that's how we ended up in Chattanooga, Tennessee. On one of our trips, we, we made many trips though, trying to figure out where to go. And on one of our trips to Knoxville, Tennessee, we saw a sign over the interstate. It was, you know the ones, there, there's a grid of bulbs and so they make words that are kind of blocky letters and you only have so many words that you can make, which is probably good because we don't want drivers distracted for too long, right? Um, now, in Illinois, I'd only ever seen ones that said things like, buckle up, it's the law, or click it or ticket. But these good old threats of the law didn't work so well in Tennessee, I guess. I guess they're a little bit too independent-minded there, which was great role modeling for this, um, for this rule-following Midwesterner. It was good for me to good for me to see. So instead of click it or ticket, they had, ain't nobody got time for a wreck. <laughs> ain't nobody got time. We got to slow down. Ain't nobody got time. A couple of weeks ago, I was at a coffee shop and I overheard some women talking about mobile app development. Uh, mobile app development is designing and writing computer code for applications that many of us use on our, our cell phones. Um, I'm actually building my first mobile app, which is going to be for parents and caregivers of youth who are going through Our Whole Lives, or OWL. And it will have a summary of each workshop, suggestions for reflection and discussion questions and other resources. And it's been a really exciting project for me to be working on, but it's also been lonely and frustrating trying to learn how to create apps all on my own. So I was pretty excited when I heard these young women talking about mobile app development. And I went over and introduced myself. I asked if they knew anybody who could advise me. And they said, well, my friend Nadia knows that technology, but you know, 
She's a student, so she's really busy. Now, perhaps that was a way of protecting her friend from a stranger. It's hard to say because it seems the most popular way to say no in our culture in this time and place is to say, I'm sorry, but I'm too busy. In some times and places, there have been phases of life when people were not so busy, namely childhood, including being a student and retirement. My early understanding of retirement came from my grandparents, who watched my brother and me after school. They sat in their easy chairs and read a lot of books. They always had time to listen and to talk with us. My grandmother cooked, my grandfather did yard work, and we all had plenty of time to play Rummy, the card game. My grandfather was a farmer, so in the spring and fall, he would still go out and help his sons in the field. But for granddad, going out and driving the tractor and the combine was play. It was enjoyable for him. He didn't have to do it, but he wanted to, and it brought him joy. His playful presence lightened the mood for the whole crew. Now many of the people, now many of the retired people I know today may retire from one job before they take a new job. Others are done working for pay, but they're busy with caretaking or social justice activism. It's possible that maybe I just don't see the people who are at home reading like my grandparents did because they're at home reading. So how am I gonna see those folks? Um, but I, I'm just amazed by how busy retired people are these days. Similar to how I'm amazed at how busy children are, how busy youth are, how difficult it is just to get some time with my niece and nephews between all of their activities. What I've been noticing in, in my own generation is that while once upon a time I could call a friend to ask about having coffee or a meal later in the week. Now I often text or email with people just to schedule a phone call. <laughs> you must have the same experience or know what I'm talking about, a few of you. Um, because if we were to call and announce, we would just play endless phone tag. We're seemingly always in the middle of something, and so don't pick up the phone unless we've, we've planned on it ahead of time. So you might be familiar with the website Quora, where you can ask a question and people will give you answers, and then other people can upvote, which basically says, yes, that's a good answer, and so it moves toward the top of the list, or downvote if it's not a very good answer. And Tim Holmes on Quora writes, so this is in response to the question of why are Americans so busy. We Americans say we're busy because we want to be seen as important. If I'm busy and you're not, what does that make you? It's very hard not to be busy. That means you're lazy or out of work or unfriendly or somehow not worth attention. So everyone at the party is busy, busier than you. Then we all go home and watch TV alone. There was an article on Harvard Business Review about busyness as a status symbol. Um, a status symbol suggesting that I'm important, I'm valuable, I'm very productive. And somebody else made a, a reference to how advertising has changed over time, where in the past, you might have a luxury item being advertised with somebody lounging by the pool, seemingly not distracted by anything, having all the time in the world to just enjoy leisure, and how now it's you have a, a businessman with his briefcase and his cell phone and his fancy sports car because that's the one little bit of pleasure that he's got. And that's how we advertise, how some people advertise now that it's the really busy people who are connected with luxury as opposed to this idea of having leisure time as being um, an indication of 
of having made it in the world. I also see busyness as um, driven by anxiety, and it's kind of cyclical. I can't talk about busyness without feeling a little anxious myself. But I wonder, I, I think that we're also, those of us who tend to be busier than maybe is healthy, are doing it for really important reasons. You know, we, we want to give our kids the best, we want the kids to to have all the talents and skills and be nourished. We want to have, we, perhaps we're going to our jobs and then, I know, I know a lot of people who are going home and they're studying computer programming or they're in some sort of training program or some sort of additional education because there's this anxiety about, are we secure economically? Are we secure financially? What's it going to be like in a few years? And so we want to have a backup plan. So I, it's, it's totally understandable that we would be keeping ourselves as busy as we do. Then there are other economic factors. I mean, there are a lot of folks who are in debt, who are um, trying to play catch up after the recession we saw 10 years ago or there's, there are just so many factors, I'm <laughs> gonna try to narrow it down a little bit. But there, it, um, there are a lot of people who are working extra jobs, trying to play catch up on the debt that they've acquired. And I can understand and relate to that myself. <sighs> Is there anybody else who feels a little stressed out thinking about all this? Yeah, yeah. And you know, very similarly to Amy's story with the God who added play, who mixed things up a little bit, that's what I really think is missing. Play and connection. So what we what we lose out on by keeping ourselves so busy is play which leads to creativity and resilience and connection. So I think the cost of this busyness is that we're less resilient as individuals, as families, and as communities. I know there are people, friends and family, who might not reach out for my support because it's risky to be vulnerable to ask for support, and they might think that I'm too busy and not want to get turned down because, oh, I'd love to help you, but I'm really too busy right now. I've spent the last six years getting through seminary, so my partner of five years doesn't know what it's like to be with me when I'm not working, going to school, and otherwise taking on way too many projects and commitments. He recently, he recently told me that when we're spending time together, he's concerned about the consequences. He's afraid that if he spends time with me, it will mean that I'm up late working on homework and not getting enough sleep. He doesn't say it, but, but I'll tell you that I have much less patience and compassion when I'm stressed out with too much to do. I'm less fun to be around which is robbing us both of connection and joy. So one of the things I think we can do is, is really focus on our goals. What are we really trying to accomplish with all this busyness? I was at a meeting recently where the leader was trying to determine if it was worth continuing to meet. He asked, are you getting value out of this meeting? And the overwhelming answer was, yes, this is valuable. But what we didn't talk about was what value is this providing and whether there's a different way that the same value or maybe even more value could be provided. I think it's really important that we do these kinds of reflection or analysis times. And when we're really busy, we don't tend to take the time for reflection that could actually make us more efficient and more focused 
toward our goals. Another piece of the importance of slowing down. So Stuart Brown is a psychiatrist who focuses on, on play. And he talks about, he actually started as a researcher on violence. And in studying violence, what he found was that many of the people who acted violently, specifically homicidally, had been stunted in their ability to play. They'd actually been suppressed in their play as children. And so he founded this center and is very much a play advocate now, talking about the importance of play. He, so when, when I think about play, I was wondering, OK, so what, what counts as play? Do I have to be? Do I have to have a toy in my hand? Do I have to have a board game on the table? Do I have to? What, what exactly counts as play? And what he says is that it's actually a mindset. It's kind of like how sleep and dreams takes you into a different state, cognitive, neurologically. That play does the same thing. So it's about getting into that state, however that is for you. For, so for some people, it might be doing something really physical, like dancing or wrestling. How many people feel like they would be comfortable wrestling as an adult? I, a, f a few people, yeah. I loved it as a kid. I would, and and it's, it, it's allowed in these very defined contexts, right? If I want to study jujitsu or, um, or grappling techniques, then you know, there it's okay, but for some reason it's not okay elsewhere. Um, but some people really find that to be a great way to play. For other people, it's art, and art that doesn't have to mean anything. It's just enjoyable to create, to put color and texture and whatever you can find together. For some people, it's music. Oh, we had some beautiful music earlier today. Wow, wow. We all have different ways of playing. Humor is another great one. Who here likes a good comedy show or a funny episode, a funny television show? Yeah, yeah, humor is a great way. And you know what I've realized is that you don't even have to, so my tendency is to say, OK, I've got to add this to my to-do list, play. <laughs> no, you can infuse it into all aspects of life by just taking a little time to slow down, by just pausing a little bit, by just getting into that playful way of being can make such a difference. So before I go, I'm going to share with you just a few more. So what I found out was that actually the Tennessee Department of Transportation had had a contest where they had asked people to submit their ideas about what these signs should say. And Illinois followed suit a few years later, so that by the time I got back to Illinois, um, we had a little more interesting road signs. So I'm going to leave you with some of these. Maybe one will stick with you. And you can take that as your reminder for slowing down a little bit this week. Now, I'm going to apologize in advance. So for, for me, I would need to see some of these to, to know why they're funny. So if that's you, if you're a little slow on the uptake like me, you can let me know, and I'll, sh I'll show them to you um, after the service. Han says, solo down, <laughs> obey speed limits. Hey, Chicago, what do you say? Did you buckle up today? No texting, no speeding, no catch up. Don't text today. 
take, don't text today, make it home to your bay. <laughs> bay is a newish term for endearment for anybody who's wondering, uh, one sweetheart basically. Get your head out of your apps. Drop it and drive. <laughs> Cars have bumpers. Bikers have bones. Share the road. Pickups rock, but they also roll. Buckle up. Peace, love, seat belts, buckle up. Even Santa wears a seat belt. Buckle up, y'all. <laughs> buckle up, buttercup, arrive alive. And my personal favorite, the one that sticks with me. Ain't nobody got time for a wreck. Thank you. Again, it's good to be with you again. Please rise and body your spirit for... Thank you.